10 August, 1960. The place, Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. The time, 6 a.m. The launch crew is preparing to launch Discoverer Satellite 13 into an orbit that will carry the vehicle around the Earth over the poles every 94 minutes. The objective of this Discoverer launch is to recover an instrumented capsule ejected from the satellite following 27 hours of space flight. A total of 17 orbital passes around the Earth. The success of this mission is essential to our nation's long-range space program. For the data gained on this flight will provide the basic groundwork for future flights when it will be necessary to recover a human being from his orbiting space vehicle. As this orbital countdown progresses, a brief review of the Discoverer program events leading up to Flight 13 seems appropriate. In less than 18 months, under the direction of the Ballistic Missile Division of Air Research and Development Command, the Agena satellite vehicle has been successfully injected into orbit 10 times out of 15 launches. The Agena space vehicle, designed and developed by Lockheed Missiles and Space Division, and the Douglas Thor have provided the Air Force with the most reliable booster satellite combination yet developed in our nation's space program. The initial Agena vehicle model employed in the Discoverer program is approximately 20 feet long, 5 feet in diameter, and weighs close to a ton, minus payload and fuel. Final thrust to inject the satellite into orbit is provided by a liquid propellant engine built by Bell Aircraft. Agena, the first production line satellite vehicle is now considered to be the space truck of many satellite programs for both the Air Force and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This choice was made chiefly because of the high degree of reliability experienced in the 12 launches preceding Discoverer 13. The payload for Discoverer 13 is mated to the Agena satellite. Developed by the General Electric Company, the recovery package contains scientific instrumentation capable of making 145 separate measurements on the capsule's performance during all phases of the launch, orbit, and re-entry. The total weight of the payload, including the nose cone, is 349 pounds. Following mating, Booster, satellite, and payload are erected. For the first time, a satellite payload is destined to be returned to its builders. The significance of this recovery event cannot be minimized, or it will rank among man's major scientific achievements. House activities and the final preparations at the launch complex present the most exciting picture to the uninitiated. However, of equal importance is the manning of the widespread tracking and communication network comprising the rest of the Discoverer system. The Air Force Satellite Test Center is the heart of the launch control and monitoring system. 
located in Sunnyvale, California, adjacent to the Lockheed facility. This center is the focal point for the far-flung Discoverer network. Technical data and other pertinent communications funnel through the control center, where all system activities are coordinated. Contact with the orbiting satellite is achieved through a tracking station network with stations located at Vandenberg. Other downrange stations on the California coast. And with two ships equipped with telemetry receivers to cover the track well beyond the equator. As the satellite orbits over the pole, the next station to acquire a track is that located on Kodiak Island, Alaska. To complete the tracking network, there is the station located on Kaina Point, the northernmost tip of the island of Oahu in the Hawaiian group. Stations report manned and ready for terminal count. First stage manned and ready. Orbital stage manned and ready. The terminal count will be by function only. Minutes announced will be approximate rather than by real time. The launch sequence will start on my mark. Five, four, three, two, one, mark. On my mark, it will be T minus five seconds. Mark. Liftoff combination roars aloft, pitches over, and streaks down range. Radar tracks the vehicle as a stream of telemetry data pours into the waiting receivers. Each event occurs on sequence. The Agena separates from the booster, coasts for a few moments. Then its own engine ignites, rapidly accelerating the satellite to an orbital velocity of nearly 26,000 feet per second. Almost immediately after orbital injection, small gas reaction jets start the vehicle into a 180-degree yaw turn, the first phase of the recovery sequence. Approximately one hour and a half after launch, the Satellite Test Center receives word from Alaska that radar has acquired the satellite on its first pass. Discoverer 13 is on orbit, and everything is proceeding as planned. Now, all attention shifts to Hickam Field, where the control center for the recovery operation is located. Employing data received from computer operations, the predicted impact area is located on a plot board. Out on the Hickam flight line, the aircraft comprising the aerial recovery forces are made ready. There are four RC-121 radar picket planes to monitor the descending capsule and to direct the C-119 pickup aircraft. The C-119s are equipped with aerial recovery devices to snag the parachuting capsule. In the event of failure to snatch the descending capsule in the air, there are two Pacific Missile Range Victory ships standing by in the impact area, carrying helicopters to effect a sea recovery. On the 17th pass of the satellite, the deorbiting sequence will start as the vehicle passes over the Alaskan coast. Aircraft take station with a timing factor allowing them to complete their mission and return to base well within the margins of range and safety. Approximately 200 miles out in space, 
The vehicle comes over the pole on pass 17. And the capsule ejects. Retro rocket thrust sends it earthward and soon the parachute blossoms to slow the hurtling capsule to a descent rate of 25 feet per second. The aircraft are vectored in to make the recovery attempt. The capsule descends just out of visual range of the nearest C-119 and impacts the water. The capsule is designed to float for sufficient time to enable a helicopter to arrive from one of the Victory ships. The closest of the ships, the Haiti Victory, sends its helicopter to the impact point as the other aircraft circle overhead. Space age history has been made. Aboard the recovery ship, the capsule is placed in a special container for eventual transport back home. The first public showing of Capsule 13 occurred during ceremonies in which the President of the United States removed an American flag from the capsule. This flight marks not only a clear first for the Air Force Lockheed team in space technology, but marks a major contribution to American international prestige. Eight days later, the success was repeated with Discoverer 14. All events occurred as predicted and the aerial recovery was achieved without difficulty, demonstrating that this concept is practical. Other flights will follow with an increasing percentage of success as more complex vehicles and payloads make their bid for space conquest. This time it was instruments, soon small animals, and then man will make his first jump toward outer space.